Good morning. Welcome to GCF Northeast online service. Praise God. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. And what a wonderful day. God has given us another day to experience Him, to enjoy Him, His faithfulness, His kindness, His goodness, His grace, His mercy. Oh, praise the Lord. Important announcements first. Well, uh, today is the last day for the submission of your nominees for deacons and deaconesses. And hopefully, uh, by the end of uh, this month, the last Sunday of month, we will have our election. Or the Sunday before that, we will uh, announce the list of uh, the deacons and de deaconesses for our election. And also, as I have announced last Sunday, that we are going to have our first on-site service. That is after the lockdown, the first in-person worship on April 11, the second Sunday of April. I hope that you pray for this. And by next week, we will hopefully this week, we are going to post guidelines in our page. And also, those who are sick, those who are immunocompromised, those who are convicted by their conscience to stay home, you can worship with us via online. And uh, hopefully, we need some equipment, but perhaps you can lend us for a day. Uh, that is every Sunday. And uh, promise we will return it uh, the, the night uh, uh, after. Thank you so much. And so today, we continue with our study on uh, the Gospel of John, and we're in chapter 8. Actually, the last verse of chapter 7 and the first 11 verses of chapter 8. On March 22, 1824, an incident took place in Madison County in Indiana, which came to be known as the Fallen Creek Massacre. Six white men murdered nine Seneca and Miami Indians and wounded another. The six men, white men, were arrested. They were tried and they were sentenced to death by hanging. One of those men was John Bridge Jr. And he was sentenced to die on June 3, 1825, together with his father and his uncle. And on that day, John Bridge Jr. and the crowd watched the hangings of uh, John's father and his uncle. And uh, the crowd actually waited expectantly for a pardon from the governor. With no sign of pardon, a sermon was preached as the crowd waited expectantly. Finally, John Bridge Jr. was led to the gallows and a rope was lowered over his head. But as the men waited for the signal, there was a loud, wild cheer that uh, arose from the back of the crowd. A stranger rode forward and Look the condemned man in the face, and he asked, Sir, do you know in whose presence you stand? Bridge shook his head. He said, No. No, he, the man said, There are but two powers in the universe that can save you from hanging by the neck until you are dead. One is the great, powerful God of the universe, and the other one is J. Ray Brown, the governor of Indiana. And he said, The latter stands before you handing over the written pardon he announced john bridge jr is pardoned in an instant what had looked like a hopeless situation turned into a door of hope john bridge jr went home he settled down opened a dry goods store and died 51 years later i told you that story and to to ask this question can you imagine the fear that gripped the heart of this young man to watch his father and uncle die, knowing that he would be next. No, na imagine niya po ba yun? No, nandudun na po siya sa galos, nandudun siya parang stage, di po ba? At nakalagay na sa kanyang leeg yung tali at nagwi-wait na lang ng signal upang hilahin at siya po ay mabigti. My friends, perhaps it must have been a moment of terror and only a few have experienced but I know of a person who had experienced that feeling. You know, this poor, sinful woman whose story is related or told in our passage this morning had the same kind of fear as she is led trembling into the presence of Jesus. My friends, she knows in her heart that she will die a very painful death by stoning. However, her path 
led to the great, powerful God of the universe. And when she met him, everything changed forever. And this morning, as we see the forgiveness given by the Lord Jesus Christ to this adulterous woman on that day, I uh, want us to examine ourselves today. You are present somewhere in this story. You may be like the woman, condemned by everyone, needing forgiveness. Or you may be like the Pharisees, self-righteous judges of others, but unable to see their own need. But hopefully, after the service, you will recognize your need to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who gave forgiveness when condemnation was justified. Our passage this morning, again, is found in chapter 7, verse 53, to chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. John 7, 53, uh, till chapter 8, verse 11. I'm reading from the NASB. Please read with me. And everyone went to his home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple area. And all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began teaching them. Now the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. And after placing her in the center of the courtyard, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? Now they were saying this to test him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. When they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now when they heard this, they began living one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the courtyard. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on. Do not sin any longer. That's God's holy and inspired word. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And as we pray to you, Lord, and turn to your word, Lord, that you would bless this congregation and everyone who is watching right now, that you would give them an open heart and reception to hear and to understand the word of God and that the Holy Spirit would speak to them. And Lord, I ask that you would also help the preacher and you know his heart that he is a sinner and he needs your mercy and grace. And I ask you to speak to him. You've called him. You've used him. Hear this prayer in Jesus' holy name for his sake and our good. Amen and amen. Now, before I give you the background, it is worth to note that there is some question about where this story should be placed in the Bible or if it should be in the Bible at all. Most modern translations note that the entire story is absent from many old Greek manuscripts, the oldest Greek manuscripts. Some translations or translators put brackets around the story. Others, they put it in their footnotes. And others put it at the end of the Gospel of John. Looked at historically, some of our church fathers commented on it. But others, actually, they did not know the story at all. No? And, uh, and so, a sermon like this, my friends, is not a place to discuss the detailed matters of textual criticism. But uh, let me quote St. Augustine. You know, this comment was made 1,600 years ago. He said that some copyists omitted the story because it seemed to make Christ too lenient toward the sin of adultery. Yet when all is said and done, even the text uh, to all critics who doubt that it belongs in John's gospel, they agree that 
this is an authentic account of a true encounter between Jesus and the woman who was caught in adultery. And the church as a, so as a whole has seen it, brothers and sisters in Christ, as the true spirit of the Lord. And I may add that there are also no major doctrines at stake in this passage. So let me uh, tell you the background. Jesus presents, remember, he presents himself to the crowd at the Feast of Booths as the Old Testament Christ that is to come. And uh, uh, he told them, I am the one. And the religious leaders and, and the priests, the Pharisees, they got angry at Jesus. So they called the guards to arrest Jesus. And when the temple guards came back, they said, you know, we listened to Jesus, to his preaching. And you know what? No ever, nobody ever preached like that. We were captured by his word. And all the more, the religious uh, leaders got angry. Now, the seventh chapter of uh, John ends with everybody going home for the night. Jesus does not go to anybody's house. He goes to Mount Olives, you know, where he spent the night there praying. He comes back uh, early in the morning to the temple to teach. And as he is teaching, the Pharisees and the crowd come with a woman wh whom they caught in the act of adultery. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, the Pharisees has decided that, okay, we're not going to uh, tell or we're not going to send our temple guards. We will just discredit him publicly. So will he, not, he will not be influencing people. And here's, how go, here's what we're going to do. We, we will tell him that we found this woman in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses says that uh, the punishment should be by stoning. She will be stoned to death. What do you say, Lord? We will leave it to you, Rabbi. And if he says, the, the, the Pharisees were saying, if he says that uh, she must be stoned to death, imagine the impact of it when she says that, when he says that to the crowd. Or if he says, let her, let, let her go, you know, that will be in violation of the Old Testament laws handed down from Moses. And, uh, uh, and they will say, is this your God? He cannot even obey the law. Either way, they discredit him. So what does Jesus do? He kneels down and writes something. The only time he ever wrote anything. And then they say, they press him. Come on, give us, a, give us an answer. Give us a reply. Give us your decision. And finally, he stands up and he says, He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And he kneels down again, and he continues to write. Then finally, apparently, they read what he is writing. And these Pharisees, beginning at the oldest, walked away. And Jesus finally looks up to the woman, and he says, Woman, which is a term of honor. Woman, where are those who condemn you? None? And the woman says, None, Lord. And he says, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now we see in verse 3. May I read that again? A condemned sinner. Now the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery and after placing her in the center of the courtyard. Can't you just hear the conversations going on as they were on the way uh, dragging this uh, poor woman, sinful woman, through the streets? Ah, huli na natin si Jesus dito. Tignan natin kung paano ang gagawin niyang sagot dito. Pero kahit ano'y sagot niya, tiyak. Mahuhuli natin siya dito. This will be the end of Jesus. And these people, they had stones in their hands. Stones of judgmentalism. Stones of hatred. Stones of indignation. Stones of self-righteousness. You see, the Pharisees, the scribes, they were well-known, well-educated. They were men of wisdom, of high moral standards. If anyone had a question on the law of Moses, these are the people who had the answers. But although they were religious, they were not godly. And their intentions on that day were not good. You see, the Pharisees, they are proud. 
They are cunning. They are arrogant. They are ruthless. They are thoroughly hypocritical, self-righteous people. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as the narrative makes clear, hypocrites make the worst judges because zeal to condemn often hides an evil heart. Now, these religious leaders brought, again, no, a woman caught in the act of adultery in their haste to bring this woman to Jesus. They didn't give her sufficient time to get properly dressed as she is presented before the public. She was certainly humiliated by the public accusation and the disclosure of her sin. My friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, sin is indeed a shameful thing. No matter how skillfully it is hidden from the eyes of men, Jesus knows it all. And one day it will be revealed before all. According to Luke's, uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Now, listen. According to Leon Morris, to catch someone in the act of adultery so that it would hold up in a Jewish trial for execution was no small achievement. The witnesses actually had to have seen the couple going through physical movements that could be capable of no other explanation. Did you get that? Compromising circumstances such as seeing a couple entering a room, then leaving uh, the room where they had been alone, or even seeing them lying on the same bed were not sufficient evidences. It would not be enough to say, I saw them entering the bedroom and then I saw them live. No, they must have witnessed the act itself. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you cannot read this, however, without asking yourself, where is the man in this adulterous union? The couple had been caught in the very act and yet, only the woman was presented to Jesus. Did the man escape? Brothers and sisters in Christ, perhaps it was a setup. They talked the man into convincing the woman so that they could catch her in the act. And by prearrangement, they let the man go free. Now, in verses 4 to 9, we see their cruel scheme. Let's, uh, let me read verses 4 to 6 first. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? Now they were saying this to test him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus took down and with his finger wrote on the ground. My friends, John in this gospel exposes the very motive of the mob, they were not really concerned about the woman's adultery and also uh, protecting the purity of the society in their town. They wanted to trap Jesus by creating a situation where he would have to choose between his message of forgiveness and obedience to the law handed down from Moses. Did you get that? My friends, by presenting this woman to Jesus, the Jewish leaders hoped that Jesus would be put on a dilemma. He, he would be put on a spot. And if Jesus said she, uh, would be, she should be put to death, he might be seen as uh, rebellious. It's kind of a rebellion against Rome because Jews didn't have the right of capital punishment. And if he said, let the woman go, that would, be, that would appear to be a violation of the law. And he would be, Jesus would be at odds with Moses. Either way, he would be in trouble, or so they thought. Now, we should note again, brothers and sisters in Christ, that these men, these religious leaders, didn't care about the woman at all. To them, she is simply this woman. She is not even treated as a person. She was used as a bait to trap Jesus. 
they humiliated the woman. They professed, brothers and sisters in Christ, that they respect the law of Moses. They claimed that they were protecting uh, uh, public morality. And they professed that they wanted an advice from Jesus. But it was all a fake. Brothers and sisters in Christ, just as this adulterous woman was used by her former lovers for selfish reasons, the critics, the religious leaders, used her for their personal gain. And they recognized that Jesus was a threat to their little empire that they had built by exploitation of people and uh, teaching false or giving false teachings to, uh, for their personal gain. My, I was reminded of this. A, a, a classmate of mine now uh, told me about this saying. He said, just because you blow out the candle of someone else, it doesn't mean or it doesn't make your candle shine any brighter. Let me repeat that. Just because you blow out the candle of someone else doesn't mean or doesn't make your candle shine any brighter. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you cannot build up yourself by tearing down someone Jealousy will destroy your chance at success even before you even have the chance to get started. And these Pharisees, they wanted to blow out the candle of Jesus in an effort to make themselves look better or more spiritual. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let me ask you, does it disturb you when Christians badmouth other Christians? Does it disturb you when Christians badmouth preachers of the word, blowing out the candle of someone else does not add voltage to your spiritual battery. It actually drains it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may we not be like the Pharisees who were guilty of pointing out the failures of others while ignoring their own in order to advance the invisible ladder of social status. May we not see people as tools to be used and discarded as needed to advance our personal agenda or personal gain. And in this passage, the moment was just a pawn for these religious leaders to be used and to be discarded in their attempt to trap Jesus. Now, not only the religious leaders were guilty of using the woman for their personal gain. You know, they were also using the scriptures for their own personal agenda. These men were also sinning against the sinless son of God. They weren't concerned about God's honor and about the holiness of, uh, the, holiness, uh, of, of the people among God's people. It just so happened that the law had given them a weapon to be used against this woman and against Jesus Christ. You know what? They were using scriptures to judge others, but not using the scriptures to judge themselves. And that is very common among Christian circles even today. People use the Bible for their own uh, selfish ends to judge others and to bring down their enemies. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I am not, nor does this narrative suggest that we, <laughs> sorry, we ignore sin and its devastating effects on people's lives. But the scripture teaches us, the scripture teaches us, brethren, that using other people as a stepping stone for our success is offensive to a holy God. Using other people as a stepping stone for our personal agenda is offensive to our holy God. The most offensive sin described in this narrative is not the sin of adultery. It is the malice the arrogance and the innocence of the Pharisees 
of using the sin of another person for their personal gain while ignoring the sin that resides in their very own heart. You know, the passage has also been used by a lot of people who want to justify their sin. When their sin has been exposed, they arrogantly say, Who are you to call me a sinner? Don't throw a stone at me unless you are without sin. This attitude expressed in that statement totally misses the whole point of the story. So the trap has already been laid. What did Jesus do? In verses 7 to 9, when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now when they heard this, they began living. One by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the courtyard. Not one of them actually anticipated what, how Jesus would solve this. You know, Jesus knelt down and began to write with his finger. Hindi po natin alam kung ano po ang sinulat ng Panginoon. Actually, no, yun lang yung uh, time sa gospel na makikita natin that the Lord Jesus Christ wrote something. Hindi pa na-preserve. Sayang. No? Others, my friends, no, many, many have been intrigued by this. Uh, scholars and students through the ages. And others were saying that uh, uh, maybe he has uh, wrote the Ten Commandments, which God wrote with his finger on the tablets of stone. Others have suggested that he wrote the names of the accusers with the commandments that they broke. For example, Diego, murderer. Diego, lying. Isko, coveting, like that. And various Old Testament scriptures have been suggested. Some have even suggested he wrote the local name of the pastor, uh, the, the name of the local pastor, the name of the elder, the deacon, the, the Sunday school superintendent. Now listen, whatever he wrote, the Pharisees and the scribes apparently misunderstood him. They thought he was just stalling for time and they kept pressing him. Come on, give us your reply. Give us your decision. Answer us. And so Jesus stood up. And then he told them. He looked them right in the eye. And he said, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Actually, the word that he uses is sinless. So he's saying, let him who is sinless throw that first stone. And brothers and sisters in Christ, the result is almost humorous. They are stunned. They were speechless. They were sure he was going to let her go. But instead, he completely upheld the law. Now he says in effect, yes, she must be stoned. She must be stoned. But I'm going to appoint the executioners. And they were shocked at his words. My friends, it is very important to notice that Jesus upholds the law. Many people take, uh, talk, uh, take these uh, uh, words of the Lord Jesus Christ to mean that adultery is not a, a, it's just a minor sin. Jesus upholds the law. Adultery is sin. It violates the marriage. It destroys society when it spreads and, become common and becomes commonplace. It wrecks homes. It injures innocent children. It attacks everything that God holds dear. And so in the eyes of strict justice, what the woman did deserved punishment, being stoned to death. And Jesus upholds the law, much to the, sur the surprise of the scribes and the Pharisees. But that is not all that Jesus does. He also sees the hearts of these men. What he says in effect, you are no better off than her. Your hearts are filled with anger and murder. Malice glittered through your eyes as you sought to explain, exploit this woman's circumstance. 
this woman's unfortunate situation in order to trap Jesus. But Jesus read their hearts. And what he saw was worse even than the woman's sin. While these scribes and Pharisees were standing there, stunned, Jesus again knelt down and began to write. And then verse 9 says, Now when they heard this. Now listen, this is important. Now when they heard this, Jesus wrote something, right? And they heard him. Hmm. Isn't that intriguing? You know, they could see what he wrote. And the words ran in their heads as if they were spoken. Now when they heard this, they began living one by one, beginning with the older ones. What a tremendous disappearing act takes place here. The oldest one, perhaps the longest record of sin, suddenly remembered that he had an appointment. And then the next one said, my wife called, I have to be there. And then the next and the next and the next. They disappeared one by one until no one was left but Jesus and the woman. And lastly, in verses 10 to 11, we'll see the complete salvation. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on. Do not sin any longer. What? A beautiful, wonderful picture. Do you notice how Jesus calls her attention to the fact that she has no more human accusers? Jesus has dismissed these judges because their malice disqualified them to serve. And then came these amazing words. Neither do I condemn you. Brothers and sisters and girls, Jesus has the only one. He has the right to condemn this woman. He was the sinless one. The one who, is, who fulfilled the qualifications to stone her. But he did not do so. Why? Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is clear that Jesus forgave her sin. Without forgiveness, justice, must be satisfied. God never waves his hand and dismisses the sin as though it is of no account. No. His own truth, his way, his righteousness, his holy character demand that any deviation from righteousness, it must be punished. And so justice must be satisfied unless sin is forgiven. Mari, siguro magtatanong kayo, Pastor, paano pinatawad yung babae Hindi naman nag-confess. Hindi naman nag-repent. Hindi nga nagsabi sa story, I am sorry. Paano nangyari yun? My friends, of course, for the forgiveness of sins, there must be repentance. What God requires is acknowledgement of evil. There must be repentance. God cannot forgive sin until it is acknowledged. God cannot forgive sin which is not acknowledge when you say yes i'm sorry i did it i was wrong please forgive me forgive me you were right that is repentance and forgiveness can come but where does this woman do that Sa natin makikita yan? the answer my friends is within her heart we must remember that she's dealing with the one who knows the hearts of every man he knows what is going on in the inner life, what is going on in the inner self, the inner intentions, the intentions of her heart, their inner, the inner thoughts. Jesus knew her heart. Somewhere in the course of this uh, incident, she had repented of her sin. My friends, Jesus forgives her sin and then sends her forth to live a brand new life. Even though she's guilty, remember, she was caught in the ark. By God's grace, she lives with a clean slate, a new life, a new power within. So what's the application of this story? First, 
Jesus' forgiveness of my sin is not limited by the severity of my sin. This woman who stood before Jesus in the crowd had just committed the act of adultery. The sin that she committed was one of the worst sins, worst crimes. During their time, it was punishable by death. It rank right along with murder, with witchcraft, and offering of human sacrifices. No matter how severe her sin was, no matter how severe your sin might be, remember this, God's grace, God's forgiveness is always greater. You see, some people will not come to Jesus because they think that they have gone beyond the scope of God's forgiveness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if God can forgive that adulterous woman, if God can forgive those who put Jesus on the cross, if God can forgive me, He can forgive anyone. If you are alive, you are not outside of the reach of God's forgiveness. Jesus is the Lord of the second chance. Number two, application. Let us abo avoid being judgmental, just like the Pharisees. And you know, we're guilty of judgmentalism when we treat suspicions and rumors as facts. Judgmentalism put opinions ahead of the facts. We must make a full, patient investigation of a matter to obtain clear proof. And we are also guilty of judgmentalism when we are quick to detect minor faults in others while being blind to our own graver sins. You see, judgmentalism is two-faced. In Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, you have no excuse, you foolish person, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that matter in which you judge someone else, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And the third application, it's for saved people. Let this be a reminder of how you have been forgiven. When we forget all about what we have been forgiven, we either fall back into it or we lose our love for the one who forgave us. Second, let it be a challenge to examine yourself. Ask questions. Are you living a life of sin right now? Is there something which you need forgiveness? Is there something for which you need forgiveness? Is there something that you need to leave behind? And third, let it be an example for the kind of forgiveness that we are supposed to give to one another and to those that are a part of our everyday life. My friends, if you are not yet a Christian and have never received Christ's forgiveness for your sin, then the application for you is very clear. This is an invitation for you to receive the forgiveness Christ or God's forgiveness for your sin and cleansing from your guilt. Brothers and sisters in Christ, no sin is too great to be forgiven and no sin is too small to need forgiving. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the gospel of the Lord Jesus and for the fact that without him, we could never deal with our sins and forgiveness and pride and arrogance. We couldn't, but you can. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can change our hearts. Help us particularly on this day, Lord, to have our homes to be a place of loving discipline and purity. And may rejoice in the name of Jesus. Oh, how sweet it sounds. This is our prayer. Amen and amen.